thank you all so much for joining us tonight and spending your Tuesday evening here in our store. Um, my name is Amali and I'm the events director here, here at Books Are Magic. We are so excited to have Kelly McMasters and Lee Newman with us tonight to celebrate the launch of Kelly's newest memoir and essays, The Leaving Season. But before we get into all of that, I just have a few logistics to point out for how tonight's event is going to go. First off, mask wearing is optional, but encouraged at tonight's event. If you'd like a mask, we have some extras up at the front register where you checked in. We will be doing a hand-raised audience Q&A towards the end of tonight's discussion, so please start thinking of questions to ask and hold on to them. After the talk, Kelly will be signing and personalizing books at the alcove next to where you checked in. We'll let you know where and when to start lining up for that. And lastly, if you're joining us virtually on the YouTube live stream, we would love to encourage you to buy a copy of The Leaving Season online using the link in the live stream description. All right, let's get into this. In The Leaving Season, Kelly reflects on setting, selfhood and identity, marriage and subsequent divorce, and the duality of being a creative and a parent. These essays have been hailed as gentle and gut-wrenching, so we can't wait to hear Kelly read from them tonight. Kelly McMasters is the author of Welcome to Shirley, an Orion Book Award finalist, and co-editor of the anthologies This is the This is the Place and Wanting. She lives in Long Island, New York. And as I mentioned earlier, Lee Newman joins Kelly in conversation tonight. Lee's debut collection, Nobody Gets Out Alive, was long listed for the National Book Award. Her stories have appeared in Harper's, The Paris Review, The Best American Short Stories, Electric Literature, McSweeney's Quarterly Concerned, and many others. When not writing, she takes care of her two kids, two dogs, two chickens, and beloved disgruntled cat. <laughs> all right, that's all for me. Without any further delay, please join me in welcoming Kelly and Lee. <laughs> Hello, I know some of you out there. So happy. Um, I am so proud of you. I am so excited for you. <laughs> I know that I'm so professional. But this book, I read this book and it was like, literally, I'm almost crying. It was such a beautiful experience to read. I mean, I guess it is personal for me in some ways and that I've known you in these different like sections of your life, but seeing how you interpreted it, how you wrote about it, um, you wrote about, I mean, it was like a different experience because it was translated into artistry. So I also feel like while writing your personal story, you made some kind of artistic growth. Were you sort of aware of that? Like, was it the material that caused you to, I mean, like some of the notions of like setting and how you wrote almost like in pure poetry. I mean, honestly, it was prose, but not really. <laughs> you know, um, you know, how were you um, approaching this book? I mean, were you just thinking about the personal and then the writing sort of came out of it? Or were you trying to think about the two at the same time? Oh, my gosh. Lee, that, um, I love your writing so much. <laughs> and to hear you talk about my writing is going to make me cry. <laughs> yeah. um, that's a great question. I think because so much is so personal. Yeah. Uh, the craft and the writing of it was a great distraction, mm. right? So, yeah. so thinking oh, yeah. about it in terms of a, um, a project, a literary project, and what can I do differently with this essay? How can I form this differently? Um, sort of took the sting out of, in certain drafts, right? Um, took the sting out of the emotion of what was happening on the page in yeah. many ways and helped me process, helped me... Um, gain distance from right. what was um, what took a lot of drafts to 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 kind of wrangle in a way that I felt like I was the capital W writer and not just the narrator stumbling through the life. Yeah, it's like it made it, it gave you guardrails yeah. and permission. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like it was. Yeah, I can totally see that. So, for those of you who haven't read it, you know this book, you know goes from like Kelly's youth in New York City all the way into marriage and motherhood and then leaving uh, the marriage and as a, as a single mother. 
Um, so it's like a big wide gamut of time. Um, but I was also wondering like, how did you come up with the title? I mean, it's <laughs> perfect. Look, a good title, right, doesn't narrate and it doesn't try and um, paraphrase, but it's sometimes I think a good title is like a, like a glance of a feeling of what the book is, right? Um, and I just like wondered how you, I mean, it's the perfect title. So I just wondered how you got to it. So Lee named my first book. Oh, I forgot that. <laughs> <laughs> I forgot that. <laughs> One. No, I did not. Um, but I did ask you when I yeah. was between a bunch of titles. So this book has had, I want to say, four titles. Mm -hmm. um, and and then there were titles that I was terrified of. So mm -hmm. because of what I knew I didn't want the book to be, yeah. um, I, for a long time, didn't want to write a book called The Artist's Life. Or, yeah. I'm sorry, The Artist's Wife. <laughs> oh, The Artist's Wife, yeah. Um, oh, yeah. wow. Yeah, yeah. I didn't and, want you to write that book either. No. <laughs> <laughs> no, and so so that was sort of this um, this space in my head that I had to write through, and I almost had to write a draft of that to know what mm. not to write in, in some cases. So right. That, that was not a title. Um, and was that title coming to you? There's a very poignant essay. Well, actually, in two places in the book that comes up, where her ex-husband is painting a picture of her and it does not go as she had hoped. It is not a romantic gesture where he's painting with love. It's, you know, a very clinical um, process yeah. and uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think, I think there were, there's so much about place and identity in here and yeah. how identities shift and for a period of my life, whether I wanted it to be or not, um, I was simply the artist's wife, and I sort of lost my own identity. You know, it's so funny because I never thought of you that way. Mm -hmm. But when I read this book, and I was listening to you in the book say like, and we would sit around smoking cigarettes, and I was like, you smoked? <laughs> you know, like, and you, you know, you dated a hairdresser in Williamsburg? <laughs> and like, I didn't realize like how rock and roll you were. Uh, you know? <laughs> I mean, um, yeah. But let's go back to this other idea yeah. that you were just talking about place and community and shifting yeah. ideas because like one of the most potent things that you do is that you're able to capture not just place, but community. Mm -hmm. So the first community is in, you know, downtown New York with lofts and cigarettes and artists and writers, all my favorite people. <laughs> uh, and then the second part is when you guys move to rural Pennsylvania and they buy this falling down farmhouse and they are living, you know, it's not the quaint um, New England farmhouse. It's the upstate New York farmhouse, mm -hmm. you know, dear, dear country. Mm -hmm. And um, I mean, I'm not one to talk because I'm from Alaska, so it's not like poetic <laughs> there either. But, um, oh, come sit down. We have time. Come, come up front. I feel lonely. Um, um, I was hoping that maybe you could read a part of that move, to, that part, because it, um, it's so evocative for me. Like I learned so much, not just about the place, but about the community of the people that lived up there, mm. you know, the complexities of them. Um, but just read and then we'll talk about the politics and the everything. Okay. Okay. Do you want people or place? You can do whatever you want. Mm -hmm. I love it all. All right. I guess this goes back to also your question about the title and this uh, for a long period during this, yeah. uh, during this period of my life, uh, I couldn't write. And I think I I couldn't even write in my journal. I had a, um, an event on Sunday and one of the women said, um, you know, were you journaling at that time? And the honest answer is no, because even that wasn't private. Mm -hmm. And when I did come to the page, I was not myself. And so it felt really false to be writing. Um, in a way that I knew, right? It's very strange to be- a Wait, wait, can you, well, can you just slow down? Cause I'm, <laughs> I'm sorry. Yeah. You, you were not yourself yeah. on the page or in life? In life. Or both? Both, both. And actually. so when you wrote, you would recognize that you weren't yourself yeah. Yeah. in a way that made you confront it. Whereas in life you weren't being yourself mm -hmm. and you could like live with that, that it was less obvious. 
Yes, and I I didn't want to admit that I had mm. to leave. I didn't want to admit what was happening in my marriage, in my life, and writing it, even yeah. if I wrote it in a journal, would make it true. Oh my god! Um, and so I stopped writing for a long for a long time, and. Uh, when I opened the bookshop, it was good because I could read <laughs> at least. Yeah. And, uh, but then um, the anthology, which the last time Lee and I were in Books Are Magic together, it was to listen to her read uh, from her gorgeous essay in This Is The Place, yeah. uh, which was an anthology I co-edited with Margot Kahn. And working on that anthology is what got me writing again. Oh. Because being able to have these amazing writers send me their drafts yeah and also realize oh right it doesn't have to be perfect <laughs> yeah first of all and then second uh, the topic was home but it was home as a four letter word and and my home was imploding <laughs> and so it was amazing to have these writers send me work where they were trusting me and i was seeing all of the difficult, complex issues that they felt related to home. Um, and then I realized, okay, this might, I, if they're brave enough to write this down and share this, then maybe I am too. And so I wrote this, the title essay, The Leaving Season for that anthology. Oh. Um, and and that is, it's very different. If you've read that one, yeah. this one and this one. I was is, like, I didn't put those together on any level. Yes. It's different, but, yeah. um, but this, ultimately became the title because I think going back to that journal idea, leaving takes such a long time. Mm -hmm. And even now, um, I think that's, that's the thing that I never saw in someone else's work when I was reading about it was, was understanding, I will never stop leaving. Mm -hmm. And and that I kept thinking, well, when I, when I, the day that I move out of my house, the day that I get the new job, the day that I sign the divorce papers will be done mm -hmm. and you're never done. Yeah. And so that I think, especially when you have children, especially when you have children. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and there's a comfort in that in some ways. Um, but the leaving season here was actually, this essay was the beginning of the leaving because it was the first time I wrote it down. Mm -hmm. um, and, it, and I was not divorced when I wrote this, but um, yeah. All right, so I'll just read um, the first few paragraphs of the leaving season. So we'll get mostly place, maybe a few people. All right. There is always something to hunt in Northeast Pennsylvania. There is squirrel season and beaver season, grouse and bobwhite quail season, mink and muskrat trapping season, bobcat and buck and bear season. There is both a fall and a spring season for wild turkey, and you can shoot crow from July 4th through April 5th, but only Friday through Sunday. Starlings and English sparrows are fair game all year round, except during spring gobbler season when these small birds can only be shot before noon. <laughs> but according to the state's 1843 songbird protection law, you can never kill an eastern bluebird or you'll face a $2 fine. Mm -hmm. Since moving here from Manhattan, these are the rhythms to which I grew attuned. Who is hunting what? Who is harvesting what? And which chores need to be done? The old man down the road starts splitting logs for next winter on Memorial Day. St. Juliana's, the creaky wooden 150-year-old Catholic church around the corner, begins selling homemade pierogies midwinter. The stooped and withered church ladies huddle together in the steamy warmth of the church kitchen a few evenings a week to make them. The camp traffic starts in June, shiny BMWs and Lexus SUVs speeding like dusty comets down the dirt road, <laughs> leaving an entire summer economy in their wake. During all of this, no matter the time of year, gunshot cracks break across the backs of the hills that surround our small farmhouse echoing through the sky like an old-fashioned call and response. Yeah. I mean, the thing is, I mean, if we just are going to focus on setting here for a minute, yeah. which I would like to, um, you know, you write about this farm and this farming community as if 
you've lived there all your life. Mm. I mean, you know the name of all the flowers and all the birds and um, you know the name of all the weeds and all the trees. I mean, I feel dumb. I, I have been like living in Connecticut. I'd be like, uh, that's a one with bark <laughs> and that one over there. Um, <laughs> how did you, was, did it come to you naturally? Were you like just, or, or did it have something to do with your childhood growing up like in, on Long Island? Because I feel like it did. Somehow you were incredibly aware in a painterly and like, like deeply botanical way of, of, of the natural world. I hate giving Long Island any credit for anything. <laughs> um, I'm very annoyed that I live there now. Uh, but no, there's there's some subversive things about suburbia. That yeah, it's fun. Um, but but I, I actually think yes, growing up where I did in Long Island, uh, I grew up next to a wildlife refuge where we just lived essentially, and that's where all of our games happened and. Uh, and I knew those trails and I didn't know the names of things, but I could tell you what they tasted like, smelled like, sounded like, all of those things, the sensory details. Nobody knew what they were called. Yeah. Um, you know, maybe honeysuckle. I knew what that was. I could identify mm -hmm. that. But that was because we ate it. It was our yeah. candy. You know, it yeah. wasn't. Um, and I think before that, as an only child, a proud only child, um, <laughs> I think we, my family, my parents and I moved about every six months for the first few years of my life until I was about six. And we would show up in on a golf course because my dad was a pro, a teaching pro, and they'd, you know, stow us in, in, um, in above, you know, the pro shop or something in a little apartment. And then six months later, he would lose that job and we'd move to, um, to a ski mountain where he would make snow, do EMS, teach skiing and we would get tucked away in whatever you know housing they offered those folks and each place in my mind the whole place was ours <laughs> and so I would be so excited to figure out okay so where 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 on the mountain is this happening and um you know there was one place in particular and I couldn't believe it when I bless you um found the photo because in my mind it was, in here I talk about our castle year yeah. in Lancaster, um, where my kids and I talk about this place that we're living as a castle. If you go and see it, it is definitely not a castle. It had no heat, it, you know, it was not a castle, but to us it was a castle. And to me, this place where I lived with my family upstate um, was amazing. It was, it was um, beautiful and it was right at the sheer edge of a cliff and I would wait you know, for the birds to come every day and with bird seed and, um, and I saw a picture of it later. It was, you know, just like a little dumpy single wide. It was, mm -hmm. um, but to me it was everything around it. Yeah. And, and it was wonderful. My mom and I used to sit and listen to records. We only had one car. So we'd just wait for my dad to come home from work and we'd just sit around and listen to records by the pot belly stove. And, um, it was beautiful. So, I think, I think having, um, being very isolated, all right, mm -hmm. um, and kind of peripatetic, moving around so much, and that I would try and look for something, some kind of stability in the natural world where, oh, that, I know that tree, oh, mm -hmm. I know that pine needle, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to people, maybe. And that's what you did when you were isolated in this farmhouse in this marriage. Like one of the interesting things about the tone is like there is all this beauty when you talk about the castle house yeah. or you talk about, you know, bu building the garden and pulling the rocks out and making the garlic grow and making the pie. There's all this beauty, right? And then there's this very um, foreboding, um, sad undertone. And it's the contrast between the beauty and then the like foreboding sad you know so I'll give you an example um but for the night it felt good to be reminded of what was once between us what might be again if only we could peel back the layers of resentment that clogged our mouths and cottoned our days together in the privacy of our home I saw so much beautiful natural world inserted as verbs mm -hmm. and into these like emotional moments um 
I don't know what my question is about it. <laughs> Obviously you were aware, right? But it became kind of a technique. Mm -hmm. I think once I understood why it was so hard to leave, I, I, I really did love it there. And I saw the fantasy of what it could be. Mm. And that's, that was the heartbreak of knowing that I couldn't stay. Mm. And, and so coming from New York, right, from the city and moving to the country, I mean, I talk about it, it's sort of like this shock, like walking out of a black and white movie into color. And I just it's like, was I even awake <laughs> in many ways with the senses? Um, and and I'm, I'm really, I miss, I do today, I still miss that. And I have a beautiful garden right now, which is really incredible uh, to even just watch the one bud change across a week span. Um, but it won't ever be the feeling of, you know, tromping across acres. Yeah, I mean, there's this one moment in the end of the book too where you talk about like, even though all these things that are, are kind of um, sad and often grim, violent, scary at times, claustrophobic happen in this house. Yeah. At the end of the book, you say, I remember you're like, that porch was where I was happiest mm -hmm. because I could see being happy, yeah. even if I wasn't. Mm -hmm. And I found that so poignant. Mm -hmm that like um, the dream of the dream of happiness like overtakes the reality of it. And I remember coming to see you yes. at that farmhouse and up with your bookstore mm -hmm. and being like, oh my God, Kelly is so lucky. I can't believe their lives together. It's so funny, the time my marriage was also falling apart, but I didn't know it. But um, uh, uh, <laughs> my leaving season took a little longer. Uh, but, um, but <laughs> Um, I think we should also talk about, I mean, we're, I can see how you did this with tone, mm -hmm. how you did it with the language, how you did it with the natural world, and then how you created this, you know, arc of the beginning of the marriage and then the end of the marriage and how to leave and disengage yourself. Yeah. But I'm just curious because you chose the essay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, there's a very, like, you could have made a straightforward memoir, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it has an arc. It has a beginning, it has a middle, it's an end. So why did you choose to write this in memoir? Mm -hmm. It's my question. Yes. Well, and I think, I mean, in essays. I know, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> um, it's similar to asking you why short stories and not a novel, right? Yeah. Uh, certain things just want to live in certain spaces. And I think for myself, I'm a natural essayist. Mm. Uh, it is where I'm comfortable. <laughs> and this was such an uncomfortable book that yeah. I needed comfort. Um, and there's, a particular grief that comes with leaving, not just leaving a marriage, leaving anything, leaving a sense of yourself, um, leaving a puck shop that you love, yeah. uh, a place. And I think that grief is not linear. And so for a period, this was a memoir and I tried to write straight. And the my inability <laughs> to to simply say, well, this happened and this happened and this happened. That's not how life works, um, especially when you're um, doing, when you're experiencing, um, whether it's divorce or motherhood or anything like that. And so one of my favorite books is by Joan Wickersham and it's called The Suicide Index. Oh my God, I love her writing. I, mean, yes. I love her writing. And you know, she also has a crazy short story collection called like, oh. what we, The News from Spain? Yes, The News from Spain. Yeah, yes, it's Joan, also uh, nonlinear. So yes. fantastic, amazing she, writer. The way that she thinks um, unlocks, hopefully you have a few copies here tonight because I feel like people are gonna yeah. buy it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, the way that she thinks just unlocked a lot of what my sense of story could be, what the possibility was. And I think with, in similar, the reason I bring that up, with suicide, grief in particular, um, there are certain things in life that are not linear. And leaving is one of those things. And so every time I tried to start a story, it was it was layered. And, and with the essay, I could reach into one spot and and then examine it 
and then pull back out. Mm -hmm. And and it is chronolo chronological, chronological. <laughs> um, it is chronological, mostly, mm -hmm. um, but not perfectly by any means. And and I think I was really nervous to make it a memoir in essays. That's how it was originally shown to my editor. She took a chance on that. Halfway through, she and I said, maybe this should be a memoir, and we tried it. And it just, um, I think it does more justice to the process because in the same way that you never stop leaving, right? And, and the verb leaving, you never get to left. Yeah. And, and so there's no, um, there is no arc. There's no beginning, middle, and end. It's just, and the essay I think is flexible in that way that, um, that you can dart into a moment <laughs> and unpack it and then come back out. Yeah. And also it was so interesting in your essays, you often, in each essay, you often had like a side subject you were discussing. Like sometimes it was the intrepid, <laughs> which is that battleship, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. Or there'd be a side subject of chess moves mm -hmm. or there'd be a side subject of, I don't know. Um, but it was also, I think that was, I mean, I'm wondering if that is also another way of like giving yourself guardrails. Mm -hmm. Like, okay, I'm getting into the, sh the crap. Yeah. I'm feeling a lot right now. And let's talk about the rook. <laughs> <laughs> you know, let's talk about the children. Mm -hmm. And then I'm getting into it again. And it is, that is very much, is very much of an organic thought process of how we, we process things. Like yes. we can only take it for so long. It's really hard to, in the same way, I will say that um, when you're sitting for a painting, if, if anyone here has ever sat for a portrait, um, in, until you do that, you don't realize what your body does when you're still for a very long time. And you don't, you can't, you know, <laughs> be smiley and straight up, um, you start to sag, your face gets drawn. Um, and I think in the same way, um, the enthusiasm of, an arc, yeah. Um, you know, you you want to you want to get to the end, and and there's this um, in in my class. I sort of talk about an emo like you know those slot machines in Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. So uh, and you get the three like cherries or whatever they are. Um, I I can sit with an essay for ten years. I mean, one of these did it took ten years, and it was just an image. And then there's an emotional register to the image and then there's something else will happen or a scene and it will match and I don't know why. Mm. And that's when I know, okay, that's an essay and I have to write into it to understand the relationship between those two things. Mm -hmm. And those two things help me understand each other and why. So like the I'm castle thinking. apartment and then the rook piece of yes. chess. Yes. You put those things together. Mm -hmm. Right. And, and only when I realize, oh, strategy, right? The old Vivian oh. Gornick, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, strategy is key in that essay. Mm -hmm. And I thought, oh, yeah, chess is strategy. all strategy. And my dad never taught me chess when I was a kid. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I wish he did because I might have been more strategic. But both of my children, now they play chess differently, but and they have learned how to lose. Um, and they, and I can tell so much about their personalities by how they move on the chessboard. And so I was not, I didn't know how to play chess. I didn't know how to leave in the right way. Well, and it does seem like, I mean, because there are some scenes in this book where I'm like, you know, um, there's some arguments. Um, you know, I grew up with like a lot of firearms and I grew up with like a lot of hunters and I grew up like stuff went down. So I'm, you know. So when I see signs of it, which there are signs of that in this marriage and it's extremely rocky. And for me, it's like, you just don't do that. You do not, you do not pick up a gun at that particular moment. You're like, mm -hmm. mm -mm. but you know, you're kind of ice skating along um, in your, in your, um, I think, I don't think it's denial, but I think it's like frozen mm -hmm. state, but then you open this bookshop. And if all the things that I could, this is like, it couldn't be a novel, right? right. Like <laughs> there's like, <laughs> fighting and violence and isolation and all this stuff, but what ends it is a bookshop. You know, like, if you pitch that, you'd be like, no. <laughs> uh, 
Thank you. <laughs> it's just not credible. But maybe you want to talk a little bit about the bookshop, opening it, what it was like. And it was, just for the record, the bookshop is as was as beautiful as she describes. It was magical. <laughs> Can you tell everybody about it? Yeah, so um, it started as a fluke. I mean, a friend had a space and needed um, someone to fill it. And we were at dinner and it was 250 square feet, a dollar a square foot. It's not New York, right? right. Um, <laughs> now, there also was no bookshop in about 100 miles. I think I figured out that the Golden Notebook in Woodstock was the closest bookshop to us at that time. And that was very far, I think. 91 miles Thank if you. you went direct and 121 if you went the fast way. Lee. I'm oh so God. weird. I am a weird reader. <laughs> That's true. That is the exact line with the exact numbers. <laughs> um, yeah, and, and I thought, you know, I grew up mostly in a town where there was no bookshop. Mm. So I was a library kid. Thank God for libraries. Thank, thank you, God. libraries. Um, but I, at that point, was committed to having and raising children in this place. And so I thought, okay, I'm, I'm going to be the bookshop for mm. whoever needs it. Yeah. Um, and, and it was incredible. And I think what the conversations I've been having a lot around this book so far have been about marriage and what women in particular um, are able to articulate um, about how they want to show up in a partnership, what's fair, mm -hmm. um, what feels right. Mm -hmm. And uh, and I was not able to do that for whatever reason. I mean, I have a book about trying to figure out the reason, um, but the... Um, the bookshop, when we partnered in a bookshop, for some reason, when those inequities appeared... Yeah, I mean, he did not work there. No. And you worked there all the time. I'm going to be clear about the inequities. <laughs> yeah. We were supposed, it was supposed to be 50-50, um, right? And many relationships, marriage or not, um, that's that's the goal, right? 50-50. Um, it's never... <laughs> I don't think that's ever possible. Um, and... Or it's not possible for both people to think that both partners are mm -hmm. contributing 50-50. That's, I think, a good difference. Um, and so for whatever reason, in the bookshop, when I could see, okay, um, I'm doing a lot more work here, uh, I was able to identify it and also feel solid in my... Um, distaste for it <laughs> and, yeah. and it felt like I could own that and say wait a minute this is not fair in a way that I couldn't in the marriage mm. and um and I think that because you were earning a lot of the money and he was staying at home and like fixing things in the house and so that was an inequity and you were putting money away I mean for savings and he was not and you were doing all the child care and he was not yeah. and so then the bookstore somehow became the yeah. thing that showed you yeah not fair yeah yeah, that, that was the thing. And and it also, we were talking about isolation before. Um, it pulled me out of isolation and mm. made it visible. And so it made the relationship visible. It made me visible in a way that I had become invisible to myself for a very long time. Uh, and, and I think suddenly having conversations about books with these amazing people who walked into the bookshop reminded me oh i there's some someone in someone's in there yeah. <laughs> and and though that's really what kind of reactivated me and saved me you know there's this powerful scene the most powerful scene is when that woman i'm assuming it's a woman that friend comes in and says mm -hmm. she comes in at the end of the bookshop and mm -hmm. kelly's cleaning up and she goes you know I, I can i just stay for a minute and kelly's like oh okay what, what do you want she's like you know you can leave mm -hmm. can't you and you're like, leave what? You know, and she's like, your marriage. Yeah. And it's just like, mm -hmm. wow. I mean, it not only exposed you to friendship and warmth and all these things that you've been mm -hmm. longing, it also exposed you to the reflection of how the outside world was seeing what was going on. Yeah. I'm so glad it happened. Oh, that's, that moment is one of the most important in my entire life. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. I'm so grateful for it. I love that woman. I don't know who she is. I'm assuming it was a woman. Oh, yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Well, I just, there, I want to say one more thing and then we're going to open up the floor, which is that, you know, I remember a couple of years ago, maybe by a couple, I mean 10, uh, <laughs> where people were like, memoirs had to be these big things, you know, like someone had a drug problem or you had to be a celebrity or there was a tsunami or like, you know, like a, a, I could go on about the kind of like, you know, kind of big sexy clickable topic things that was required and we kind of lost you know the more uh language-based subtle experiential memoirs um and um it's interesting because your book is coming out and it's also is maggie smith's book who gave you a quote which is yeah. maggie smith's book wrote um we could make this beautiful about the end of her marriage and then there was a, a book also this year by Elizabeth Crane, Betsy Crane, and I forgot the title, um, and I'm sorry. It's about the end of her marriage. And I remember when I was an editor reading that book, I actually acquired Betsy Crane's book, and the fact that I can't remember the title is humiliating. Uh, <laughs> but I remember some of the conversation, I was like, but it's just about the end of a marriage, you know, with the other editors. Mm -hmm. And I was like, yeah, it made me cry. Mm -hmm. Pretty <laughs> hardcore. And it's interesting that we've seen this switch now, yeah. you know? And I do think when you see one, two, three, it's not a trend, but it is, you know, the emotional heartbeat of the world, especially after the pandemic, mm -hmm. where a lot of these kind of inequities that you're talking about became yes. real clear for people. Mm -hmm. um, what do I, where am I going with this question? First of all, you should buy all three books. <laughs> um, have you, um, you know, were you, were you surprised to be in conversation with these women writers? I mean, all of you are like freakishly talented and you have your own way of doing it. I mean, Betsy's much more like snappy, fast, you know, cartwheel and Maggie is so fragment oh, fragmentary in her approach and you're so lyrical mm -hmm. um, and narrative. Um, have you thought about these books or this kind of switch in the art form itself? Hmm. Hmm. Maybe I mean genre. Right. I, I do think, I, did, I, I know exactly what you mean in terms of those conversations, mm. uh, because even trying to figure out how to explain what this book is about, yeah, um, it's not about anything, and it's about everything, right? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. And that is correct. I'm, I'm reading um, Soil by Camille Dungy. I'm right also now. reading oh that. God. It is so... Add that one to the list. Just make a pile. Yeah. And We're going to make a reading that. list yes. after this reading. <laughs> We're definitely not book people. Um, yes. And and I think also maybe because of the pandemic, right? This was sold and mostly written before the pandemic. But yeah. I think um, I think the what I'm noticing in Camille's book is she is making space for the domestic. Yeah, because it's a book about black gardening, just so that people, yes, sorry. black gardeners and the domestic and black women going outside and claiming, you know, yeah. claiming the soil, literally. Um, right, yeah. Yeah. And also essays. Yes. Because uh, essays are wonderful. Um, and, and I think a lot of this book, in order for me to write this, I thought I was uh, aiming at sort of I, was, I kept imagining that I had a an, that I was an archer, <laughs> yeah. And I was I was shooting an arrow into this sort of vortex of shame. And I just anytime I felt ashamed on the page, there's so many pieces here that I wanted to take out and almost and did take out for periods. And then, uh, and then, my agent, my amazing agent Anna Stein or Noah or you know a reader would say. No, that's that's what needs. That's why we want to read this. Yeah, you got to go all the way. And you have to, and and it's not because, right? It's not because it's um, never happened to anyone else, or because um, it's different from anyone else's experience. It's because so many people already have written to me and said, "Oh my gosh, yes, this it didn't happen to me on a cow farm, right? But mm -hmm. um, but that emotion, and and I'm." I'm so glad that I could read it and see it outside of my body um, to then know it. And and I know what I wish I had when I was going through it. And oh, yeah. It's, you know, there are lots of how-to books. Uh, Girlfriend's Guide to Getting a Divorce, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but it's, 
it's a shame, a shameful meaning, like, as a perfectionist, the failure of a marriage, um, the broken family, you know, the single mother, all of these things, all of these, you know, things that our society has constructed um, were so shameful to me that I pretended, even after I left, um, I spent one year in Lancaster um, and and I pretended the whole time that I wasn't actually a single mom <laughs> and I wasn't actually getting divorced uh, because I didn't want people to judge me. Uh, and, and I don't want anyone else to have to feel that way. Um, it didn't do well by my, by me, right? That was not healthy for me. It didn't help my children. Uh, and so I think there are a lot of things in here, you know, including, for example, a CPS case, which for a long time was the worst child protective services. Yes. Sorry. Um, that was so shameful. And I took that in and out, in and out of the book. And I finally put it in because after I started talking about it, I couldn't believe how many women, men, families had been through the same thing. And nobody, I didn't know that because we were all afraid to admit it. We were so scared to say, oh my gosh, yes, I had somebody come and count my fire, fire, you know, fire alarms and look in my refrigerator too. Yeah. And, and I want to release that. So I'm sure that, um, it's also interesting in these cases when it's the person who has created the act that creates the opening of the file, mm -hmm. the person who gets investigated is the one with the children who did nothing to make sure that they're okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the crazy making part of that, that journey. Absolutely. Yes. And, and journey isn't not the word for it. <laughs> 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 um, let's open it up that people, people want to ask questions. Yes. Totally. Hi. First of all, thank you both of you. It's such a wonderful conversation. It's so generous and um, fun to listen to. Sorry to say that, but it's fun. Um, I'm curious, when you talked earlier about the you know, the artist's wife title, like mm -hmm. that's not the right title, yeah. but to to write, um, but having to write something to say like, no, that's not the story I want to tell, mm -hmm. or that's not the way I want to tell this story. My question is, how much was written that never saw oh, the book. Yeah. And how do you go about continuing to write so much about material that's hard mm -hmm. and keep at it? Mm -hmm. So you're asking, I'm just going to say for our audience out there on the internet, um, there was so much admitted from the book and how you keep writing, writing that difficult, writing material. That difficult material. Yeah. I think part of it is um, being able to, actually being able to mother has been an incredible gift in a way that I didn't understand because I've been a writer when I wasn't a mother and I was a writer when I was a mother. And in the same way that, you know, this morning, um, not that a dog is a child, but in the same way that this morning I woke up and I was like, it's my pub day. And I walked outside and had to clean up dog shit, you know, like that. Um, in the same way that you can be in a in a dark place writing, uh, and sometimes I I I do have to go away for a long weekend or a week. Or I went to the VCCA for two weeks, and it was a, it, amazing what I could get done because I could stay in this emotional state. And I was a wreck afterwards, but I could stay there. Um, and and it is wonderful to then go to, you know, show up at breakfast the next morning and you're just mom. Um, and, and I think in terms of writing, I love research. I mean, the, the amount of research that, uh, that didn't end up in here, um, but was wonderful and so much fun to do, right? I would, and the essays that didn't end up in here, so much that I, I thought was going to I think when I when I began the book, I was fighting so hard against the shameful places that a lot of the writing just didn't work. And my editor, who who um, <laughs> I was I was describing her as um, she's sort of like when you go down and and you're sitting at a seance, and <laughs> and the you know the woman across from you says more like this, 
less like this. And I don't know what that means. Uh, but I would know that I would have to go back and she would ask one question about an essay and I would get really disgruntled and think, that's, that's not work. <laughs> um, and then, you know, I would sort of slide back into the revision period and realize, oh yeah, that's actually the question. Mm -hmm. And I didn't, I wasn't brave enough to answer it the first time. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of it is fear and writing around that fear takes so much time. And mm -hmm. I think that's what often ends up on the floor is the writing that is getting in the way of writing the, the actual thing. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, does that answer your question sort of? Yeah, <laughs> yeah, no, I, yeah, for sure. Amy? Um, you always ask hard questions. I'm scared. <laughs> no, 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 it's not going to be hard. No, it is. I'm <laughs> So, at what point did you think I'm writing something that I'm going to publish mm -hmm. someday? At what point did you start thinking that this was a book that you were going to publish right. one day, because, that it would be out in the world? Yeah, I yeah. find that like when writing about things that are like extremely personal, potentially dangerous, like yeah. all of those things, like, how did you transition into feeling comfortable with the idea that this could li live in the world? I am not comfortable <laughs> with that, <laughs> with yet, uh, with the idea that this is going to live in the world. But you did it. But I did it anyway. Um, I think I was, I was joking um, with a group that I spoke to this weekend that my dad, growing up, um, I feel like we should have a conversation just about dads, by the way, but, yeah. um, but he would always tell me, you know, you're never going to be the most beautiful. You're never going to be the smartest. Uh, you're never going to be the richest person in the room, but you can work harder than everybody else that you have control over. Wow. Right. And, <laughs> and I think <laughs> it's great. Actually, it's, it's empowering. It, it is. It is it's not really a put down. I mean, there's, a, there's always going to be somebody richer, he's prettier, right. taller in he's, my case. He's but, absolutely, yeah. yes, taller. They're everything. all, those tall people are out there. <laughs> uh, no. uh, and, and I think in a way that was what helped me get through this book was every time I got scared, I just went more and put my head down and wrote. And if I got more scared, you know, I would just keep going. Yeah. And, and I think I, there's also in my experience, you never know what someone's going to um, react about. The first email I wrote, I woke up to this morning was um, from the intern in the old bookshop. Oh my gosh. <laughs> and I I only I think I only wrote like a, a sentence about him in here, but he was actually such an important person to me in the life of that bookshop. And he his his mom brought him in and knew that he needed books, but didn't know how to he needed a life in books, but didn't know how to make that happen and, and we ever we all just knew okay he needs to be here somehow and I was like great I'll can you be my intern <laughs> and um and the <laughs> the note that I received this morning was so beautiful in in tone the writing itself was one of the best reviews I've ever read <laughs> um and so when I wrote the Paris review column it was always um, notes from a bookshop, and then whatever the uh, the month was, you know, May, comma, do your thing. Yeah. And uh, on the second reading, I noticed his subject line was notes from your bookshop intern, oh. May, believing season. Oh. Wow. Right? I mean, it, I do not have interns like that. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't seen him in years. And, yeah, but and, you made a profound effect on his life just just the that's what that's why i'm writing i know that um even a few early readers who wrote to me about you know their experiences reading the book who are going through particularly uh, divorces themselves it just um i don't want to let fear stop me and a very a very wise lawyer uh <laughs> told me <laughs> That truth is not actionable. Mm -hmm. And I know my intention for writing this. 
and uh, and it has nothing to do with my ex. It's about me, um, and so hopefully that. I don't know if that stands up in a courtroom, but um, but that's how I got up this morning and came here. <laughs> yes, one one last question. Um, thank you both. This has been so amazing. Um, I cannot wait to read this. I I was here like precisely one week ago today for Claire Dieter's Oh um, yes, reading Monster. About monsters, which for anyone who doesn't know, it's all about how do we reconcile or not the art of monstrous men who are quote unquote geniuses. Mm -hmm. And in the book, she talks about, you know, it's like these men who are monsters and great artists and writers, their crimes are like literally rape and murder and just hard. And then for women, it's leaving. <laughs> like that's the, bad, yeah. the big bad thing that we yeah. do, which we leave. Mm -hmm. and, um, mm -hmm. and, you know, so there's that. But um, and I would argue, you know, like, you know, if you compare it to Doris Lessing, you stayed. You know, you didn't leave, you stayed, you know? And, um, and so I was wondering, uh, because I love Claire's book so much, but it's not answering, fulfilling this need. Do you have any writer, artist, role models who were also passionate, stable, loving mothers who were, uh, okay, thank you, like it's so hard, like, <laughs> yeah. like is it, you know, who, who, and who love the shit out of their kids mm -hmm. and, like are so passionate and about their careers and writing and writing and writing beautiful stuff mm -hmm. and maybe you are you know like maybe that's this is like the beginning of a new canon mm -hmm. and um of 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 arts and letters and like women who love their kids and who are beautiful writers and love the written word just as much and um but do you have anybody like that for you that you called upon okay i'm just going to repeat it yeah Sorry. it was really beautifully spoken um, but the question was about, do you have any role models, people that managed to be able to write, you know, with all of their ambition and their talent and their beauty and be stable and raise children and juggle all these things. Mm -hmm. And specifically women, especially, oh yeah. Oh yes. I meant yes. Women and mothers. Um, and one part I loved about the question was maybe this is the start of a new, of a new canon mm -hmm. because your book is actually saying that, that you were you know, diving deeper and deeper into the writing, even as you were raising two kids on your own as a single mother for a lot of this book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I would say first, the crime is uh, leaving and telling. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Right? Just writing it down. Um, and I think a lot of people in this room know that that is often the crime. And I would also, to answer the I love that question. At first I thought, oh my God, I don't know, but I know so many. I know Lee Newman, I know Amy Brill, I know you know, Camille Dungy, who um, her whole point of the book in Soil is, look at me washing the dishes and making a garden and helping my child through Zoom school, right? Not being afraid, I think for so long we were, oh, nobody wants to read about mothers, you know? And, and it was, um, belittling um, and and I'm thinking of this incredible panel uh, that we had at AWP called Motherload Sonora Ja holy fuck like she <laughs> sorry um, <laughs> <on YouTube. laughs> uh, she her book how to raise a feminist son and the laughter that just came out right um, Rebecca Wolf yeah. I mean she is kicking so much single mom ass on <laughs> with her column uh, and and Joanna Rakoff. And I mean, she, in every line, right? That the generosity that she, if you know her in person, that she is in person comes through every line of her work and that's what makes it so beautiful. Um, and I think what I'm realizing is so much of this book is about the danger of isolation and when you feel that you're alone. Um, and and even just imagining all of these writers that I know who are doing it as well uh, feels really wonderful. And you, Dominica, you are one of those writers. Honestly, uh, Dominica came to my college and talked to some of my kids there, not my kids, <laughs> uh, some of my students there, and um, 
the what you shared with them uh, I mean it was life-changing really as is this book <laughs> which I think we should all buy yes. okay One quick PSA in your little um, in your little gift bags. Uh, yes, that's me in suburbia. Um, you've got a postcard, and on the back of the postcard it says, "A time I left or wanted to." If you can take it home, think about it, write your answer, and then send me a picture of it or post it to Instagram. And but there are directions on my website. You can mail it to me. I am obsessed with postcards. I have a huge collection. <laughs> Uh, you can mail it to me if you want. If you want it to stay anonymous, keep it anonymous. I can make that happen. Um, or just use it as a postcard to send to a friend that might need it. That's what this is for. Okay. Thank you so much for coming. Oh, that's wonderful. Um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you to everyone who asked questions. Thank you to Lee for moderating such a wonderful discussion. And of course, thank you, Kelly, for celebrating this launch with us. Um, just a few quick reminders for anyone who are still with us um, on the live stream. You can buy a copy of The Leaving Season by clicking the link in the description. For those of you that are here with us in person, we do have plenty of additional copies available for purchase up at the register, as well as Kelly's anthology, Wanting, as well as Lee's collection, uh, Nobody Gets Out alive <laughs> um, and also of the kelly and lee book club list we do have copies of soil yes. so you should for sure check it out it's really really good um lastly as i mentioned earlier kelly will be signing and personalizing books at our little receiving window my coworker bex is going to point right now to where that is um so we ask that you all kind of line up down the center aisle curve around and please make sure that you grab all of your personal belongings with you so that we can start to break down the chairs and rearrange the space. All right, so that's all. Let's give these two one last round of applause. Thank you all so much.